speaker is uh, Peter Haynes, who's the Managing Director of Index Products at TD Securities. Uh, um, Index Products is a group responsible for index and market structure research. In addition, Peter handles relationship management for a few key Ontario-based institutional <coughs> investors and manages TD Securities Client Relations Committee. Peter is also a member of Standard & Poor's U.S., Canadian, and Global Index Advisory Panels, uh, panels as well as the Ontario Securities Commission's Market Structure Advisory Committee. Welcome, Peter. And um, I, so in terms of questions, if we have time after Tom, we'll take questions. Otherwise, if we're not quite on time, we'll probably leave that till the end of the session. And there'll be a short uh, coffee break after Peter's presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Barbara. And thank you to PDAC for the opportunity to uh, present what we'll call the con side of the debate on high frequency trading. And thanks to Andreas for giving you guys uh, as truly as good a one-on-one as you're going to get on that topic. Uh, I was curious when I was walking over here that this is a PDAC event because when I was starting my career at the Toronto Stock Exchange in 1989, I was just graduated out of school and somebody invited me to the PDAC annual conference. I guess it was six months after I'd started. I didn't have two nickels to scratch together and the conference was here a lot smaller than it is today. Uh, but I do remember if you're a 20-year-old kid who's just graduated university and you come in, all of a sudden you're walking into a bunch of suites where there's free beer. Uh, it was quite a great experience. So uh, that was one of my first uh, opportunities. I won't, won't forget that. Every time my colleagues are going to the PDAC conference, I always think of, uh, of my first uh, introduction to that conference. Uh, I read Sports Illustrated. I'm sure some of you do as well. And in the front of Sports Illustrated, they always have that sign of the apocalypse, which is some statistic that is absolutely ridiculous or some event that's occurred. Uh, further to the topic of the uh, fiber optic cable going from, uh, from London to New York to try and speed up trading, a couple of weeks ago, you may recall when the Fed announced that they were going to delay tapering, uh, the S&P gapped up 3%. So the big debate today is why did the futures market react first? When the futures market is in Chicago, the stock market is in New York, New York is closer to Washington than Chicago, information should be received in New York in two milliseconds, in Chicago it should be seven milliseconds. So why did the futures react quick, uh, first? And the question is, which to me is a sign of the apocalypse, we're debating milliseconds, we're debating whether or not the Chicago traders somehow had that information before anyone else. And the irony is that the mention of tapering, if I remember correctly, was actually not in a headline. It was in the third paragraph of the document, which further to that makes you start to understand this isn't just about reading headlines, this is about reading text and machines reading text. And to me, that's the sign of the apocalypse. And whether or not the futures market actually got the information first uh, ahead of the, uh, the equity market, who knows? Uh, but to me, it's an apocalypse. Uh, my general thesis uh, is, and this is one that is, uh, I suppose, probably puts me on an island, uh, certainly amongst our regulators and, and amongst my, my colleagues in the industry, because uh, I do spend mo most of my time focused on market structure. My general belief is that competition amongst markets is a flawed exercise. It is proven to date to be nothing more than a cost exercise that's uh, allowed several intermediaries to become very rich. In fact, you may note, you know, a lot of hockey fans in the room, you notice that the Florida Panthers got sold last week. The guy who bought the Florida Panthers, his, na Panthers, his name is Vinny Viola. Vinny Viola's previous job was on the floor of the Mercantile Exchange before he became chairman of NYMEX. And then when NYMEX was sold, he became the chairman of a high-frequency trading firm called Virtu which is one of the largest HFTs out there. So another sign of the apocalypse is that the HFT community is making enough money off of our order flow to be able to buy our hockey teams. So um, again, my belief is that competition amongst markets is flawed. What we need to encourage is competition amongst quotes. Uh, and that's the big problem today. And my thesis will be that, and going back and, and flushing out a little bit more from what Andreas said, my big thesis is that the demutualization of exchanges is what's driven us to the point we are today. So my goal in this presentation is to explain to you why I think certain aspects of today's market structure, which encourages uh, unnecessary intermediation, needs to be somehow fixed 
Uh, and I know from your perspective as members of the investment community and on the issuer side, uh, it's quite frustrating to you. So why don't I just first, I do spend a lot of time talking to issuers about market structure. Just first uh, mention some of the, uh, the common questions that uh, I'm sure CEOs are getting, a, uh, investor relations is getting, who's trading our stock? Everyone wants to know why Broker 79 is the number one market share uh, in trading our stock today, and I answer that question a lot. Uh, I'm sure Thomas does as well. Uh, who, what's an HFT? Um, why did certain firm trade uh, a block of our stock and then we called them up and said, who's trading or what's going on? And they saw it's derivatives related. Yeah, that's a mess. It's part of our tape. Why is our volume going higher? Yet everyone we talk to says the liquidity is going down. Uh, and why did our shares move 5% five five in the last 10 minutes of a Friday and the third Friday of a month? doesn't make any sense to me. It happens to be when there's a regular rebalancing of the various indexes. Uh, in North America. So there's lots of th questions that we get on a regular basis that as issuers you're probably wanting to know and understand a little bit better. So the way I like to think of the market is as an ecosystem. To me the ecosystem is out of balance and you heard earlier uh, we have on the outside what we deem to be the natural investors. This is what, and with all due respect to Andreas, I'm not sure I heard once in that 45 minute intro any discussion whatsoever about the main purpose of the markets and who we're actually supposed to be building our markets for, which are investors, both institutional and retail, and it's supposed to be about price discovery and capital formation, and all we're talking about is milliseconds. So we've got to get that fixed. Uh, so if you look at the outside of this diagram, you can see that the naturals, and these numbers are just generalizations, represent the part of the marketplace we should be trying to design the market for. There will always be intermediaries in the middle. The intermediate, intermediaries are needed because there's temporal differences. Thomas wants to buy today, I want to sell tomorrow. And there's size differences. Thomas wants to buy 500 shares and teachers wants to sell 2 million. So there is a need for intermediaries. And if you look at the inside of this chart, uh, and you heard from uh, Andreas' discussion, high frequency traders represent about 48% of the passive quotes. We would have estimated there are about 50% of one side of uh, the order flow in the Canadian market. Proprietary traders, market makers, and broker intermediaries or arbitrageurs represent the rest. What's disappointing, disheartening, and concerning is that only about 20% of daily volume is actually where a natural buyer and a natural seller are meeting, whether that's done through the uh, institutional equity desk at RBC or Canaccord or TD Securities, uh, matching a block of shares and then trading or printing it on the exchange at the best, at the best price that you can see. Uh, or alternatively where uh, natural is working stock on, on the exchange and gets hit or lifted by a natural investor on the other side. Only about 20% of our daily volume involves naturals and that's concerning. We need to get that number a little bit higher and we need to eliminate what I'll call unnecessary intermediation. We've seen a massive evolution in our markets over the past, uh, well really seven years since 2007 when Pure became the first visible market to compete with the TMX. Uh, and since then, there's been six or seven more markets in Canada. As Andreas said, there's 14 in the U.S. plus 50 dark pools, and it's a bit of a cesspool in the U.S. I would argue our market is, is um, highly fragmented for the size of its market uh, and only getting worse. And part of that is because there's no barriers to entry. Uh, any marketplace can really come along, go to the regulator and say that they want to launch as long as they meet certain minimum requirements, which are very, very low. Uh, they're basically allowed to... Um, to launch and, and we like to think of ourselves as captive consumers because we're required to subscribe to those marketplaces, pay for their market data immediately and that's because we are required as brokers to always get our clients the best price. The best price is on CX2. Uh, we're required to be connected to CX2 because if we don't get them the best price, we violate one of the tenets, central tenets of our regulatory rule structure and that is we are required always to get the best price. So we have to subscribe to CX2. We have to buy their market data. We, have, we calculate a TD, it costs us about $1 million per marketplace to connect. Uh, regardless of what they do for price discovery, every new marketplace costs us a minute, uh, on average about a $1 million when you factor in all the technology costs, telecommunication lines, et cetera. So there is a significant cost to uh, this evolution of markets. Just looking again to, to further to Andreas's point, you can see the breakdown in trading. Uh, what this is is a slide that shows you the large cap S&P TSX 60 stocks, of which 43 are interlisted between Canada and the U.S., and this shows you where they trade. Uh, gives you a breakdown of the volume. In the United States, uh, where that marketplace is, is at absolute 
cesspool. Uh, I shouldn't say cesspool is not the right word, just so fragmented it's ridiculous. There's the biggest uh, portion of that pie chart is something referred to as FINRA ADF. That's the alter alternative data feed uh, that if you're a dark pool uh, or an ATS, you, which is generally speaking the dark pools, uh, you can report your trades to the FINRA ADF. So that represents almost a third of the volume of the United States in dark pools uh, and uh, through other forms of internalization that never actually get executed in a price discovery central order book. Uh, and that's a major problem that the U.S. regulators are trying to deal with. So looking at a brief history, Andreas did a phenomenal job. Uh, I don't need to repeat uh, what um, Andreas talked about, but I would say that the, the main uh, impetus for change in our market was uh, what we refer to now as the order protection rule, which is the rule that forces us to get uh, the best quote we can find. Uh, we've seen competition evolve in Canada, as I showed you from the earlier slide, in 2007 onward. The biggest catalyst that brought HFTs uh, to our market was the combination of the order protection rule and demutualization. And uh, why demutualization of the exchange is the catalyst event is because at that point in time, there was a change in the mentality of the management of the exchange. The management of the exchange changed how they think about the market. They thought before about their stakeholders who were the brokerage firms and their clients. Today they focus only on their shareholders. And how do they focus on their shareholders? By focusing on trying to maximize volume. And this is a simple example. When I worked at the exchange, uh, and it was a mutual uh, back in the uh, early 90s, the goal of the exchange was in, in October each year or November each year there'd be a participating members notice that would say from the rest of the year onward trading is free on the exchange because we've met our targets. We've covered our costs. That's all we're trying to do. Uh, and that would happen depending on the amount of volume that had occurred in a particular year. Uh, today the goal of the management of the exchange is to maximize volume. They'll do anything to double volume or triple volume even if it means uh, sticking or finding some way to create a new product for the high frequency traders that allows one order to become three orders because they get paid three times as much on three orders as they do on one order. Very, very simple. And everything is driven off of that with the exception of their listings business. All the market data revenues, all the technology services that they provide are all driven off of their ability to grow volume. If they grow volume, they maximize shareholder profit. So there's a massive conflict today between the interests of stakeholders in the industry, which are the brokerage firms and the investors and the issuers, and the shareholders who demand that they maximize profit. There's an overlap there. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that, but it's a problem. So if you think about how the TMX can increase their volume through natural means, the first way to increase their volume is to try to look at those charts or that pie chart and say, how can we get the 150 million shares of S&P TSX 60 stocks that trade in the U.S to trade in Canada? Well, I can tell you it's almost impossible. A perfect example was when the NASDAQ system went down a few weeks ago. Not only did we see a, a lack of increase in the volume of trading in the interlisted from Canada that trade in the U.S. on NASDAQ, we actually saw a decrease in volume, which makes no sense. You would think the U.S. investors that trade in NASDAQ would come to Canada to buy BlackBerry or sell BlackBerry, but they didn't. Uh, and again, the, there are natural habits that are almost impossible to change. It's very, very hard for the exchange to repatriate or for the Canadian market to repatriate non-Canadian flow in Canadian names. Find new investors. The primary reason our firm and Thomas's firm for that matter too, uh, we're not believers in the merger between the London Stock Exchange and the Toronto Stock Exchange was that in our view, at least in my view personally, we didn't need the London Stock Exchange to find new investors for the Canadian market. Anyone who trades now knows how to find the Canadian market. They know the listings, they know the companies, everything's available on the internet. We don't need the London Stock Exchange to become a gateway for Europe. We already had that. So that was a flawed reason for a merger that was really going to potentially drive the central processing unit of our market to London and away from Canada, and that was going to be a problem. And the final way uh, to increase their volumes is through increased intermediation of natural orders. As I mentioned earlier, if, if you can uh, if you can create three orders instead of one, you're going to make three times as much money if you're an exchange. Now, the need for intermediation. I mentioned earlier there's temporal differences. There's size differences. There's important forms of necessary intermediation that arguably would fit into what we would deem to be the high-frequency trading category. 
systematic trading that requires computers to execute orders for you and do so at much faster rates than humans can do. This includes the arbitrage between BlackBerry's price in the U.S. and Canada, called interlisted arbitrage. Index arbitrage, which involves the in insurance that products that are related, that are index products, all trade at the same price or approximately the same price, even though they're uh, different products, futures, exchange-traded funds, baskets. Uh, capital facilitation. Uh, XYZ wants to buy a million shares of a stock. There's a dealer, whether it's RBC or Canaccord or someone else, that will facilitate that transaction. We would deem a lot of those categories, not capital facilitation, but in the, what people think of as HFT. And clearly, not all HFT is bad. So one of the major catalysts for uh, the HFT arrival in the Canadian market, and again, this is really mostly market activity like Virtu and others that migrated from the United States into the Canadian market because we evolved later than the U.S., uh, is based on what we like to think of as this liquidity rebate uh, mar uh, structure, whereby the high-frequency trading firm is providing quotes on the exchange in order to earn rebates that the exchange pays them for being a li so-called liquidity provider. Uh, and that's one of the major uh, catalysts for uh, their activity in the market. These firms who what we call in Canada electronic liquidity providers because that's the term the exchange gave them, they tend to be small hedge funds. Again, I doubt anyone in this room had heard of Virtu before uh, Vinnie Viola took over the Florida Panthers, uh, but there's firms like Getco, TradeBot, Night Trading, others that we would call, uh, call HFTs that no one really thinks of as mainstream participants in the market, but they are the ones that represent half of the daily volume in the Canadian market and, and even more so potentially in the U.S. Uh, they will earn revenue, generally speaking, by, pay, by earning rebates from the exchange. In some cases, strategies are driven towards trying to capture the bid-ask spread, which is much more a form of traditional market making. Uh, they tend to be flat at the end of every day, uh, and they tend to have very short holding periods. Now, ITG estimates that in Canada, approximately 50% of the messages that get sent to the exchange are canceled within one second. Again, I'm not sure what exactly is happening within that one second, but that's unfortunate because that creates a huge amount of tax on the rest of the industries. We all have to absorb all of those quotes. Uh, unnecessary intermediation, I would say, happens when a uh, participant stands in the way of two natural investors who otherwise would have traded. Uh, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples of unnecessary intermediation. What we need to do as a marketplace is find the line where we can draw it very hard in the sand between what's unnecessary and what's necessary intermediation. So let me just uh, flush out a couple of real life examples of what might be deemed to be unnecessary intermediation. Rebate arbitrage, latency arbitrage, and what we'll call cross market arbitrage. So let me just try to start with, if you think back to my very first slide, why is our volume going higher but everybody complains liquidity is lower? So this is a very simple example. There's a million holes you can poke in this, but let me try to be as simple as possible. The market to buy XYZ is 10 at 10.01. There's 25,000 shares wanted at $10. There's 50,000 shares offered at 10.01. At 10 o'clock in the morning, pension fund comes in and wants to buy 25,000 shares of XYZ. One second later, another pension fund comes in and wants to do the exact opposite trade. Once in a blue moon, that actually will happen on a trading desk. In the good old days, uh, there would be no concern over what's going on within one second. Those orders would come in. They would be matched up, Now, Hey, I've got a seller. I'll sell that stock to you. Next thing you know, 25,000 shares of volume would trade on the tape at either 10 or 10.01. Trade would happen and be done. In today's market, the first buyer at 10 will take that 25,000 shares, lift the offering, happens to be an HFT. HFT will immediately turn around and bid for the stock. Pension fund B will come in one second later, hit that bid. The high-frequency trader has earned a rebate as a liquidity provider selling the first set of stock and then covering their short. So they've earned approximately six-tenths of a cent per share uh, in rebate from the exchange. And instead of there being 25,000 shares of volume, there's 50,000 shares of volume. So there's a perfect example of how volume has doubled, but no one in this room could say that liquidity is twice as high as it would have been absent that uh, intermediation. Another example is um, uh, when you have a pension fund, and we'll call this crowding out. This happens all the time, too. Three markets all offered the same amount of stock. This is in 480 at 81. I know when we designed this example, it was Bombardier. 
So there's three different markets, all offered stock at 50,000 shares. You've got a pension fund wants to buy 50,000 shares of Bomber. This is our example here. Uh, pension fund A lists the offering on um, uh, markets A, B, and C, buys the 50,000 shares at 481. Um, that's what should happen. The reality is what actually happens is pension fund A goes to lift an offering on one of the markets, only buys 20,000 shares, and it turns around the markets immediately bid in their face to send higher. So how can you send an order to the market where you can see it's offered for your number of shares that you want and you don't actually buy the stock you want? And worse than that, it's actually bid ahead of you uh, and you only bought 20,000 shares. You'd think, how can that be possible? Well, the participants that are on the offering side see your order coming. Uh, they can actually cancel their uh, balance of their order and be bidding at, before your order actually be able, is able to process. Uh, and I know there will be lots, again, these are simplistic examples, but they are the type of criticism of today's market structure that we hear all the time. I'll skip over sta uh, spray routers and just talk a little bit about some of the standard defenses, particularly from the academic community. Uh, certainly the argument that spreads are narrower, but what you did hear from Andreas is while spreads may be narrower, uh, the volatility of the quotes is four times as high as it was. Volume has increased. Uh, that is absolutely true, but as I just pointed out, volume does not equal liquidity. We spend all day trying to make that argument. Speed of execution improves performance. Faster systems reduce market maker risk, allows for narrower spreads. Again, I come back to why do we care about what goes on within a second. Uh, again, the unintended consequences of structural change is too great to risk. Uh, the fear of the unknown, in my opinion, is fear-mongering. Uh, and I don't know if when we went to the multiple marketplace environment uh, or allowed HFTs to essentially become part of the market after they allowed rebates to be part of the market structure, uh, we didn't have a fear of the unknown before that was allowed to happen. I don't understand why we have to worry about the fear of the unknown if we were to unwind some of these structural changes that have occurred in our market. Uh, HFT tends to be supported by the academia community. You can again see here there's a few articles that we, we cite uh, with respect to um, HFTs and the like. I would say, argue that more lately there tends to be a little bit more uh, negative publicity towards HFTs amongst the academic community uh, and certainly from the industry itself. Uh, institutional perspective is almost entirely negative towards HFT. Uh, as you know, there's a new marketplace which Barbara mentioned initially called Aquitus which is really called the, anti, you want to think of it as an anti-HFT market, whether it is or isn't. Uh, the belief is that that new market model is designed to be anti-HFT. Uh, the institutional community, generally speaking, uh, they're very well informed today, and they are very negative on the aspects of HFT that affect the ability for them to execute their orders. Regulatory perspective has turned quite negative, in my opinion, in Canada towards HFT, and that's not just because Howard Weston, the chairman of the OSC, is talking about these issues in terms of its impact on uh, long-term investors and the benefits to the market, uh, but there's certainly a general feeling amongst uh, uh, participants that the regulators are pointing their guns towards whether or not these structural changes have been good or bad for the market with a lean towards, I think, the bad. Now, what can be done to address these problems? People talk about taxes. That's not a good idea. Uh, the idea of the uh, IROC fee change around messages was a very, very good idea because what it did was it aligned the people that are creating the costs in the market uh, and driving those costs back to those participants instead of essentially creating a tax on all other investors. But as for a tax on every trade to try and find a way to uh, reduce the HFT activity, that's not going to help. Slowing down trading does not help either because the fastest guy still wins, even in a slower market. Uh, having quoting obligations, I know this is one of the ways that Aquitus is going to argue as a new market, they're going to have market makers with quoting obligations. So they think that that's going to be a better model. Uh, I agree that HFTs today have no quoting obligations. One of the reasons the flash crash happened was because immediately when we're in the middle of a bad market because of the Greek crisis and the uh, trade with volume futures orders getting bungled, and next thing you know, quotes are disappearing, all the HFTs immediately hit the kill switch. And they got rid of all their bids and offers, unwound whatever residual risk they had, and stocks like Procter & Gamble and Accenture, next thing you know, they were trading at a penny. These are multi, multi-billion dollar companies that for a brief period of time traded at one cent in that V-shaped market. How could that happen? Well, uh, HFTs that were the quotes in the market all disappeared at exactly the same time. Eliminate make-take fee structure. My firm's uh, 
very strong belief is that, and my personal belief is that that's the first thing we need to do. We need to unwind the liquidity benefit or rebates that we're providing to these participants. And I can use an example, and again, real life examples I think are best for an audience. There's a blog uh, written by a couple of guys that run a small brokerage in the U.S. called Themis Trading. And they wrote a book called Broken Markets, which really highlights how markets have changed. And in their blog last week, they talked about a, a, some activity they had in the market. They were trying to buy very large liquid security in a very weak tape. So the market's coming off and they're thinking, okay, we should be able to bid for this stock and someone's going to hit our bid because the market's weak. Someone's going to want to get off their wrist. They're going to get an itchy trigger and they're going to hit our bid. So they first went out there to buy 200,000 shares out loud at 39 cents. $42.39, whatever the number is, 39 cent bid. Stocks offered at 40. As soon as they go bid, all the offerings stack at 40 cents. There's more and more offerings. So they're thinking, okay, well, we're going to get these guys to move. So in the weak market, they canceled their 39 bid and they made it 38 bid. And by the time they could see their 38 bid, all the offerings were stacked at 39. Well, hold on a second here. You guys were just offered at 40 when we were bid 39. Now you're offered for a billion shares at 39. So they canceled their 38 bid, they made a 37 bid. Before they could blink, it was 38 offered for a billion shares. This kept going until they got to 35, and I think at that point they lifted the 36 offering, or they canceled their bid completely. But it was absolutely obvious. The person that was on the other side of that trade had no intention of trading the stock unless they received the rebate. The only way they get the rebate is if the buyer decides to lift their offering where they're passive on the exchange, their offering gets taken out, they get their 30 cent rebate and probably find a way to jump in front of another order, get another rebate, and essentially intermediate transactions that don't need intermediation. And I thought it was a great example for the real life participant to understand what's wrong with our market. Randomizing fills in the order book to eliminate the race to talk about, top a book, this has a very legitimate merit in my opinion, as something we can consider. Um, one of the problems I say, and, and we would say this about Aquatus as well, is while there's some neat ideas around the market model for Aquatus, w most of what we've seen from the regulators has been incrementalist regulation. Trying to solve things related to the flash crash has only made the market more complex. Adding another market model like Aquatus is adding complexity to the market. We would like to see the problems such as make take fixed first before we add even more complexity to an already complex market where the winners are the HFTs because they're the only ones who can figure out what's going on. And to their credit, they are absolutely the smartest guys in the room. And they are eliminated arbi eliminating arbitrage activity that exists in the market because of the structure of the market. I do not begrudge them one iota for the fact that they're doing that. We need to find a way to get rid of those structural problems. Uh, and the pay-to-post uh, markets, which we've seen, we've seen new developments here on certain marketplaces where instead of a rebate, you pay a fee if you're posting liquidity. Uh, and that's been somewhat useful for certain market participants, but that's a commercial solution to a structural problem. Uh, and I think that's something we need to work on, uh, trying to find structural solutions to structural problems. Uh, conclusion, certainly not all HFT is bad by any means. Uh, and I, I've tried to make that very clear. The root cause of the problem started with demutualization. It results in a massive stakeholder-shareholder battle, which to this day has not been resolved. Uh, and it's going to be a very, very difficult problem to resolve. I'm not sure how the re regulators are going to address this, but more incremental regulation is a problem. It's not helping. Uh, and the issuers and the investors, as my final thought, have been forgotten in this debate. Uh, unfortunately, it's about nanoseconds and picoseconds uh, and uh, where you locate your servers and how close you can get to the exchange and whether or not you're using fiber optic uh, cables or whether or not you're using microwaves to get your information from one place to another. Uh, I think that's gotten to be a bit, uh, it's gone from ridiculous to, uh, to an apocalyptic situation. So hopefully we'll, um, you know, we'll, the regulators are very aware of this. They're very well educated in the Canadian market. Uh, and I think they're going to do the right thing in the long run. It's just going to take some time to get there. Thank you very much.